Welcome to Science Class. Today we will take a look at some of the minor members in our solar system. While asteroids, comets, and dwarf planets are the most numerous objects in the solar system, their combined mass is very small. If we took every single asteroid, comet, and dwarf planet and combined them together, we would have an object much smaller than Earth. But that doesn't mean that they aren't significant. These objects can teach us a lot about the evolution of our solar system and planet. And yes, I will finally be explaining why Pluto is not a planet. Let's get started. Asteroids are small rocky bodies that orbit the sun. As we discussed last time, most moons are asteroids, but we call them natural satellites if they orbit a planet. The majority of asteroids orbit around the sun and are found between Mars and Jupiter inside the asteroid belt. Other asteroids have elliptical orbits or orbit the sun in proximity to other planets. Eros, a 34 by 11 kilometer wide asteroid, was the first to be visited by a spacecraft and it orbits between Earth and Mars. NASA actually managed to land the spacecraft on Eros, which was never one of the original mission goals. The largest object within the asteroid belt is Ceres, which is a dwarf planet about a thousand kilometers wide. Ceres accounts for nearly a third of the mass of the entire asteroid belt. So no, if we combined every object in the asteroid belt together, it would not form a planet the size of Earth or even Mercury. If you stood on one asteroid in the asteroid belt and looked around, you would not have to duck out of the way of other asteroids. You wouldn't see anything. A question that we can't answer yet is, why is there an asteroid belt? It could be that a dwarf planet was struck by something and became the asteroid belt. We will probably never know exactly. But in general, asteroids are thought to be remnants of planetesimals. The fact that asteroids come in mostly metallic varieties or mostly mineral-like varieties tells us that they are likely fragments of small objects that differentiate it. A metallic asteroid is literally a piece of the core of a protoplanet. As I said, the details, was it one object, was it two, how big was it exactly, why did it break apart, that we don't know. I'm sure you've also heard of meteorites, but there are also meteoroids and meteors. So what's the difference? They're all the same thing, but under different circumstances. There's also no real difference between meteoroids and asteroids except size. Meteoroids are 10 meters across or less. Anything larger is an asteroid. A meteoroid is what we call these objects in space. A meteor, as in meteor shower, is a meteoroid that burns up in Earth's atmosphere as they compress the air in front of them, heating it up to thousands of degrees. A meteorite is a meteoroid that does not burn up in the atmosphere, but instead makes it all the way to the surface of Earth. Most meteorites we find are metallic, but that's only because they have the greatest statistical chance of surviving the brutal entry speeds and temperatures due to them being made of metal. Back to meteors for a second. You've probably seen this footage or similar footage. While the glow is insanely bright and it looks like it's close to the surface, it really isn't. The meteor was only around 20 meters across and it vaporized around 30 kilometers up in the sky about twice as high as the maximum cruising altitude of commercial planes. However, because of the incredible kinetic energy, traveling at around 19 kilometers per second, this relatively small object released 33 times more energy than the Hiroshima nuclear bomb. Even though the closest buildings were 30 kilometers away from the blast, windows shattered and several people were harmed. Luckily, the meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere at a very shallow angle, so it streaked through the atmosphere long enough to burn up. If the object had taken a more direct path through the atmosphere, it could have reached the surface and killed many thousands of people. Meteor Crater in Arizona is a little more than a kilometer across, but was created by an object probably only 30 meters across. This could have been what the meteor in Siberia would have created. Another very ancient crater in Canada is about 100 kilometers across. The asteroid that created it would have been perhaps five kilometers across. Moving further out into the solar system, we find the Kuiper Belt. This is a region of space where comets and dwarf planets reside. Dwarf planets are sometimes also known as trans-Neptunian objects or Plutonian objects. Some objects within the Kuiper Belt have nearly circular orbits like the planets, but others have wildly elliptical orbits. 
The plane of orbit of objects in the Kuiper Belt also varies widely with respect to the relatively flat plane of the eight major planets. We will get to Pluto shortly, but first we will cover comets, the other major objects in the Kuiper Belt. A comet is a piece of rocky and metallic material held together by various ices. You can think of a comet as being many smaller asteroids sort of glued together by ice. They're not solid objects, not at all. Many asteroids aren't either, which is weird because we think of them as being one humongous rock, but they're not. If you look at footage from the landing on Eros, the asteroid we mentioned earlier, you can see that its surface is covered in boulders, smaller rocks, gravel, and fine dust. Most comets are found within the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt is sort of a bad name because it isn't a dense ribbon of material. Its total width is something like 25 astronomical units. That's far wider than Saturn's distance from the Sun. So a comet within the Kuiper Belt may have a circular orbit or a highly elliptical orbit, but because of the vastness of the Kuiper Belt, it remains within it at all times. Halley's Comet, which has a 76-year orbital period, just barely grazes the edge of the Kuiper Belt at its aphelion, its greatest distance from the Sun, but very nearly comes as close to the Sun as Mercury at its perihelion, closest distance from the Sun. Other comets that come even closer to the Sun are then flung deep into the solar system and have orbital periods of more than 10,000 years. When a comet gets about as close to the Sun as Mars, the ices that it's composed of are evaporated. The solar wind and radiation from the sun are great enough at this point to blast ices off the surface of the comet. Keep in mind that these are exotic ices with boiling points far below the freezing point of water. This is why comets have tails. But a comet's tail is many millions of kilometers long. Yeah, millions of kilometers. That is caused by the fact that comets accelerate to ludicrous speeds as they approach the sun up to 35 kilometers per second. At that speed, you could reach the moon in three hours. Now that's fast, but the solar radiation is traveling close to the speed of light. So the comet's path drags out the tail, but the solar wind pushes the material outward. Because of this, a comet's tail always faces away from the sun, no matter what direction the comet is moving, because the solar wind moves so much faster. The European Space Agency traveled to a comet with the Rosetta spacecraft. This was a 12-year odyssey in which the craft took an extremely complex series of orbits on its way to intercepting a comet. In these photos of the comet, which is spelled like this, you can see that some parts of its surface are much smoother than others, and that it's cratered in other parts. These are largely the result of sublimation of ices, the process of going from solid directly to gas. Again, as the comet gets closer to the sun, that's what happens. The icy parts of comets slowly but surely evaporate away. When all the ice disappears, the solid parts of the comet become asteroids and meteoroids. Okay, so now we get to talk about Pluto for a bit. Why is it not a planet? Well, what is a planet? That question might sound ridiculous, but it's not. The ancients thought that planets were stars. They did not think any of the planets could possibly have been Earth-like objects but they and several moons are. Then, when technology improved, we learned that planets are big objects that orbit the sun. That's not a very precise definition either. Like with the moon, we had a very clear description of what a moon is because we just knew about one. Then, when we found more, we discovered that our rigid definition of what our moon was didn't fit with the natural satellites of other worlds. So all of a sudden, we didn't really know what a moon was. And the same kind of thing happened to Pluto. Pluto was discovered on February 18, 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh, an American farmer who learned how to build his own telescopes, earning him a job as an astronomer in Flagstaff, Arizona. Astronomers were looking for a planet X because it was thought that Neptune's orbit was being interfered with by another massive planet, which is what led to Neptune's discovery in the first place, but with Uranus being the planet being interfered with. This all turned out to be an error. Neptune's orbit wasn't really off, it just wasn't calculated precisely. So there wasn't a planet X, at least not in the sense that there's a missing Neptune-sized planet out there, because Pluto is nothing like that. But the search for planet X led to the discovery of Pluto. But then, on October 21st, 2003, we found another one, Eris. The pictures of Eris were actually taken in 2003, but it wasn't until 2005 that we realized these pictures contained a Pluto-like object. 
Eris is about 27% more massive than Pluto, but 50 kilometers smaller in diameter. What makes this awkward is the orbits of Pluto and Eris overlap. Then we found a lot more of these spherical bodies in the Kuiper Belt. Nobody was rushing to declare these all as planets, and to this day, people who are mad that Pluto was declassified have no sympathy for any of the other objects, even though they are exactly the same categorically as Pluto. This is what happens when you tell irrational mammals that they're wrong. They get mad for no good reason. The real astronomers had to decide, okay, do we need to now name a bunch of other official planets and put them in our school textbooks? Or do we now have to come up with a definition for what a planet is? So a panel of scientists got together and they decided to define what a planet is. This has never been done for moons. A planet was defined as an object that orbits the sun, not another object, has sufficient mass to assume a spherical shape, and has cleared its orbit of debris. That last thing is what differentiates Kuiper Belt objects, and also Ceres in the asteroid belt, as dwarf planets. Now, Pluto is a strikingly beautiful little world. Its ice mountains poke out noticeably against the curvature of its surface, it has glaciers and open plains, and unique colors and textures. Sadly, I don't have the time here to go into that, and I won't be making a Pluto video but that information is available to anyone who wants to look it up. Finally, we get to the edge of our solar system, the Oort cloud. Except again, it's not really an edge, and the Oort cloud doesn't have a sharp beginning or end. The Oort cloud is a shell of particles and comets that hang out at the very edge of the sun's gravitational influence. Objects within the Oort cloud orbit the sun in any and all directions. The inner edge of the Oort cloud starts at around 2,000 astronomical units, but it extends out to 200,000 astronomical units. That's incredible. If you truly want to talk about how big the solar system is, in terms of size, the Oort cloud is pretty much all that counts. The Oort cloud is named after Jan Oort, who is a brilliant astronomer. He predicted that the Oort cloud likely exists. The weird thing about the Oort cloud, though, is you can't really see it. The particles that make it up are so incredibly far away, tiny, and spaced out that we just don't see them. Voyager 1, the most distant man-made object, is barely a tenth of the way to the inner edge of the Oort cloud. It will be another 300 years before we even reach the Oort cloud. We never have, nor ever will, truly see the Oort cloud, but we can know that it's there thanks to comets that we see orbiting the sun. Comet C 2013A1 was observed passing very close to Mars, but it won't come back for around 740,000 more years. By calculating the orbits of these comets, we can see how far from the sun they get before returning. That's how we know how far away the edge of the solar system is. That does it for our local tour of the solar system. Next time, we are going to begin studying the universe at large, beginning with studying electromagnetic radiation, then moving on to the Big Bang, stars, and galaxies. Thanks for watching.